Join us today as we chat with Teresa about parenting, from newborns to the teenage years, from regular summers to living through a pandemic. You don't want to miss Teresa's advice. She points out a blind spot many of, us, many of us have had as we work through this pandemic, that we've offered lots of support to camp pros, but have we checked in on our camp friends who are also parenting? Something that this episode made me consider. Current parents, parents-to-be, or folks who are dreaming of having kids one day. This is one episode you won't want to miss. Welcome to Beyond Camp, where we explore the intersection of camp in our lives. For too long, camp professionals have referred to camp as being in a bubble, and we're here to burst that bubble today. We know that camp intersects with every aspect of our lives, and we're excited to delve into those. We are your hosts, Rachel Kent. My pronouns are she, her. And I'm Cassie Bloy. My pronouns are also she, her. And we're here to go beyond camp with you today. As a reminder, please subscribe to this podcast wherever you find your favorite podcast, and be sure to check out the show notes at gocamp.pro slash beyondcamp. Now let's get started. Today, we're thrilled to be welcoming Teresa McDonald-Lee uh, as our guest to talk about parenting with us. She began her work as the co-executive director of Camp Kintail in November of 2007 and is a longtime Kintail camper, LIT, and staff member. She attended the first Kintail family camp as a three-year-old and has spent every summer at camp since that first experience, uh, which is remarkable. Uh, she's filled several roles on the camp staff, including counselor, lifeguard, on-site outtripper, leader in training, resource counselor, and assistant director. She then spent three years as the director of Presbyterian Camp Douglas in British Columbia. She is an honors Bachelor of Arts from Trent University with a joint major of environmental resource studies and women's studies and a master's of divinity degree from the Vancouver School of Theology. Teresa, welcome. We're so excited to have you. Thank you. I'm super glad to be here today. Um, so this is actually a topic, as I was saying just before we hopped on here, that one of our listeners actually reached out and was, uh, and was like, wow, I would love to hear you folks talk about parenting at camp and neither Cassie or I are parents. So we thought we should reach out to someone who was. So we're excited to get into this. Um, before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? How would you describe yourself both at camp and away from camp? Um, I am somebody who has loved camp my whole life, as you can tell from my introduction. Uh, camp has always been the place where I have felt most like myself and most where I, the place where I was most encouraged to become who I wanted to be. Um, so it's always been really important. I'm also a Presbyterian minister, and so I spent several years working in congregations before returning to camp. Um, I've been married to my partner, Jonathan, uh, for 20 years, and we have spent the last 13, finished 13 years of directing together, and oh, we're wow. still together. So that's, um, I think that's an achievement. I don't think that's easy to do. Uh, we have three kids, Ella, Lucy, and Anna. Ella and Lucy um, are 14, and Anna is 12. So they have spent their whole life growing up at camp. You could probably do a podcast with them about what it's like to be a kid at camp. They've got lots of opinions on that. Um, I love to read. I write uh, especially Canadian literature, um, but I don't have a ton of time for extra stuff <laughs> just with the age my kids are at right now. That's fair. And twins too. My siblings mm -hmm. are twins uh, and I hear all the time about how much work <laughs> twins were. I'm the oldest and then there were the twins. Um, right. So how, how did I were... not know this? Because my sisters are twins as well. Well, there you go. Um, so I feel like that adds a whole other um, aspect to this part of it, or that's what I've heard from my parents, at least. So Teresa, the pandemic, it's been a part of our lives for quite some time now. What, tell us about living with a family through a pandemic, because like, I live alone, and I have no understanding of what that's like when you have other people in your space, and yet can't really go anywhere. Yes, it has been really interesting. Um, we live, um, half of the year we live on the camp property and half the year we live off the camp property. Um, and so obviously when the pandemic started, we were living in town. And our house in town is not very large because we always say it doesn't matter because we're at camp half the year. Um, it's fine, everybody's at school normally. Uh, but it was small, <laughs> um, in part because um, the area where we have our office was also, when they were younger, the playroom, but now it's like a hangout room. Um, and so I would be on Zoom calls and I'd have children trying to go by or not wanting to go by and um, really not having um, space in our house. They were also doing school um, online all the way up until June. Um, and so 
that was tricky trying to coordinate all that. We also had a new puppy, which was not intentional, but it just happened. <laughs> so we had a puppy and three kids doing school online um, and then also trying to work. One of the big challenges with the pandemic was that we were in town and we have other staff who live on site, but we couldn't really go up there. Um, they were really dealing with everything that was happening on site and we were really in town. Um, so we had Zoom calls and all sorts of other things and met outside occasionally, but for the most part, um, we were trying to be really safe and stayed apart. So that was really challenging to not be able to go up to camp and to not see what was happening and taking part um, in what was happening at camp. Oh, wow, that sounds like a huge challenge. And did you run programming this summer of any form? Uh, so we did not run, we normally run overnight camp and day camp and school programming in the spring. So none of that happened. Partway through July, we received permission from the health unit to be able to um, have families on weekends. And so we did some like campground family camping right. um, every weekend and then some small retreats that didn't cancel. And we also host weddings occasionally. So there were a couple of small weddings that decided to go ahead. So pretty much every weekend from mid July on, we had something going on, but um, not our normal activity. So we all had to pivot and change and uh, come up with what we could do in this time. Fair, that, yeah, that sounds really challenging. So were you able to get to camp for those weekends in the summer? Well, we did, we ended up moving up to camp partway through June when we moved to whatever the next level two, <laughs> whatever it was, yeah. <laughs> level three, we moved up to camp and so we were there. But because there's a group of about 10 staff who live and work on site, they were a bubble. And then because our family's five, we were a separate bubble. And then we had another staff who comes in from town. And so she was in her own bubble as well. So we had all these bubbles and that was very challenging because normally we're all just together and we eat together and we do all sorts of things together. Um, and it was especially challenging for my kids to not be with the staff as well, to always have to keep their distance and to not enter into certain buildings, certain spaces. That's really tough for our listeners. Uh who are listening from across North America. Uh, here in Ontario, we have social circles. And so you were asked to form a social circle with no more than 10 people, which um, if you lived with a lot of people, I live with, there were six of us at one point. Um, that made it really challenging. So that's mm -hmm. a term that we use here is uh, social circles. Or Cassie, did you have bubbles in BC? It was the same sort of idea where you had a certain number of people you're only supposed to gather with. Yeah, BC was make good choices. <laughs> All right. <laughs> this, is, this is what I've determined it comes down to here. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, in theory, they got rid of uh, the social circles here recently. Yeah. Um, so, Teresa, we talked about sort of like how you would describe yourself. Are there words that you feel you would use uh, to describe your identity that you feel really strongly attached to? Uh, camper, <laughs> um, parent, partner, um, person of faith, minister. Um, reader. Those are probably the most important ones. That's fair. And we've, we've talked a lot about identity um, on this podcast, and that's what we hope to continue to do because we think it's really important. Um, and with identity often comes privilege or certain um, identities that grant us more privilege in uh, the different areas that we act in. And sometimes mm -hmm. we have more identity when we are, or sorry, more privilege at camp than others, or but maybe less privilege in other ways. And I'm curious if you ever consider your privilege and if you think you carry certain privileges in the camping world at all. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, I'm a white, straight, cisgendered person. Um, in, in my world, I'm in church camping. And so I'm also a clergy, which gives me access in a different way um, uh, to all sorts of things. Um, yeah, I, I carry tons of privilege. Um, and I'm aware of that. <laughs> and we're working on, on changing some of those things as well. But um, it's really important to identify where those layers of privilege lie. Thanks so much for sharing that with us and uh, for being so willing to identify that because mm -hmm. we think that naming these things is a really important step um, as we look to move forwards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned a parent as part of your identity, which is what we're here talking about today. And I think if you can hear it, she, she's actively parenting right now by <laughs> you can hear the knocks in the background as <laughs> we continue on. But can you, because you are a parent, can you tell us a bit about your parenting journey at camp and what that looks like? And because it seems like it might be a little bit different than what we may assume it to be. Mm -hmm. 
it's it is a journey. Um, so the first time I was a camp director was in British Columbia, and I spent three years at Camp Douglas. And um, it, my partner and I, we did it together, um, but we didn't have kids, and so our 100% focus could be on camp, especially in the summertime with no other interruptions. Um, and so when I applied for and got this job at Camp Kintail. Um, we had just had twins. <laughs> and uh, when I actually first applied for them, they were still in the NICU. Um, so they were born premature, so they were tiny. And so in some ways it was a big decision to apply for a new job when these tiny babies <laughs> were just born and we didn't know what was going on and um, thinking about moving, all of that seemed almost impossible, but it was the job I'd always dreamed of. Um, and so, made the decision to do it. And I started the job in November. And in January, I found out that I was pregnant again. And so then uh, Anna arrived, um, ironically, at our family camp weekend in August. Um, and so that first summer, I really don't remember very much about it at all. Um, and previous to that, because my I'd had a preterm birth. I was on bed rest for most of Anna's pregnancy. So I was starting this brand new job. Um, I had twins and, um, and I was pregnant. So it was a really complicated, bumpy beginning <laughs> because I couldn't yeah. do much physically. Um, and we weren't living on site and we were trying to move and all sorts of things. So it was really complicated. And I had help that first year, especially because I was on bed rest. So one of the um, camp staff had taken a gap year from high school. And so she came and she was our nanny and she looked after our two oldest um, and did all the lifting and all the heavy stuff I couldn't do. Um, and she's remained an amazing family friend that whole time. Her whole family has actually. Um, and so I got to camp um, and then Anna was born halfway through the summer and we again had staff helping to look after our kids. Um, and so that first summer was a blur. Um, and then my husband who had had um, a job outside of camp, he ended up taking the parental leave um, where we are, spouses can split the time. Um, and so mm -hmm. he was able to take off almost a full year. And he did that and then he extended it a little bit longer and then we both decided that we both needed to work at camp that with our family situation it was too difficult to be in two different places mm -hmm. um, so that was a huge decision that we made because we were parents if we were not parents probably we wouldn't be camp directors together oh, at this that's point fascinating time. yeah that's mm -hmm. really interesting um and important to note here for our listeners as well in canada parental leave is 12 months typically um yes in ontario you can split it up to 18 months i'm not sure if that's across mm -hmm. canada um, so that might be a little bit different for some of our listeners and I think makes a big difference in how we. Um, yes. And I, it. you know, because he was able to be home, we were able to split parenting and, and working at the camp together really from the very beginning. I'm not sure how people do it who have six weeks of uh, parental leave to go back to work. Um, it's very difficult. And so that first year, whenever I had to go to meetings, Anna came with me because I nursed her. So Anna came to everything <laughs> all across the board conferences and meetings and um, she was just with me that's fascinating i'm curious as to how I, I don't know if you like work for a board or your organization how they were they receptive to this um sort of entry into your job um that you came into it like with your children <laughs> at the same time was there any like struggle there at all there wasn't really an option <laughs> so <laughs> Fair, fair. And maybe it was just the honeymoon phase too, because you know I was pretty excited to start the new job, and they were excited to have a director in place. Um, they'd had an interim year that had been challenging, and so they were happy to have um, full time staff there. I mean, everybody was really supportive, and camp is such a flexible place that it was really possible. Mm -hmm. um, and there was never any question that we were putting in enough time because camp is more than enough full time. So. Um, no, they were supportive. I do work for a board, but they were wonderful. That's amazing to see that there is that support there and that it exists for young families. Um, so you really described a lot of like those early years, mm -hmm. um, thinking as they grow up there into those kind of toddler early school years, what were mm -hmm. some of the struggles you experienced as you had to transition to different schedules, different routines? Mm -hmm. So I'll say I learned this from Travis and Beth Allison. Um, when I first began, um, they Travis was um, grew up at Camp Kintel and Beth had actually worked there as well. And they were at one of our neighboring camps, our sister camp. 
at that point. And I said, what did you do? Because Beth's kids were little when she was working at camp. I said, what did you guys do? Like, how did you work childcare? And they said, you know, whenever we hired somebody, they came with their whole family, like that you hire them, kids and all and whatever else is going on in their life. And that um, we supplied childcare. And so that's what we did for our family. And then for cooks and nurses and whoever else came along that had kids, we've just always as an organization, then if we're asking them to live at camp and to do work for camp, then we supply child care for them. So we've always been, um, and our board's been fully supportive of that. And um, so we've always just hired enough staff to be able to look after the kids, my kids, the nurses' kids, and the cook's kids, um, and whoever, mostly those are the folks that have had kids. Um, and, uh, and staff have enjoyed it because it's a, a change. It's a different kind of week that they do. Um, and our kids have also grown really fond of a lot of the staff that they've looked after, that have looked after them over the years. I will say when they were toddlers, in some ways it was easier because, and younger before school, because then um, even if you're really busy in the summer, you know you have time the rest of the year to really spend a lot of time with them. But as they got going to school, I realized that time was changing because they were busy the rest of the year and I was busy in the summer. And so you really have to think through what that looks like and how to make other times special. Um, and also how to carve out time in the summer so that they don't feel like they're forgotten <laughs> as you're looking after everybody else's kids and not being with your own kids. And when I have gotten the balance wrong, my kids have let me know. Uh, <laughs> So some of the things that we, we always sit together as a family, and then there's other staff who sit with us in the dining hall, but we're always together. So mealtime is one of those times. There's um, like a rest hour after lunch. And so we always spend that time together. And since they were very tiny, um, almost every day I go swimming with them. Um, so oh. that those are kind of like some of our sacred times. And I also don't eat at the dining hall for breakfast. My husband goes up and makes sure everything's fine, but I stay with them in the cabin and we eat breakfast and we kind of start the day together as opposed to camp right away. It sounds like you've really integrated, uh, like those lives yeah. together really seamlessly, mm -hmm. uh, which sounds really wonderful. And also that like your organization is incredibly supportive of families. Like what a wonderful mm -hmm. thing. Cause I imagine that that's a struggle for some folks. Mm -hmm. And I know some families, some camp directors make different choices and have their kids much more separate from camp. And I think that's a valid choice too. And it probably depends on your kids and your comfort level and their comfort level. Uh, our cabin is right in the center of camp. So there was not really an option <laughs> to be much separate. Um, you know, their playground is in front of our cabin. And I mean, they were just in the middle of it all the time. Fair enough. And we will say, as with anything related to parenting, uh, everybody has to make their own choices and those yes. choices are valid. Uh, mm -hmm. And Cassie and I certainly aren't parents, so we aren't here to pass any judgment on anything. Um, and it's it's interesting to hear how people balance it. And you, you said mm -hmm. that your partner also works at camp, um, yes. which also adds like a whole other dimension to that. Yeah. Uh, and for us, being at camp, being able to both be at camp and parent, um, we thought was going to be easier than one of us leaving like if he left every day and went to work, then, you know, a nine to five or an eight 30 to five, like he, we would miss more time. Um, mm -hmm. So being at camp, both of us has allowed that to happen. That makes sense. And fabulous that yeah. you have had that opportunity in this mm -hmm. in the same place. So we've talked about some of the things that are a little bit harder. What have been some of your successes that you would consider through parenting at camp? And I mean, you're still actively doing it. But. Yes. <laughs> um, I think it's the, it's the relationships my children have um, had with the staff um, you know, they, every kid needs adults that aren't their parents, um, that they can look up to and talk to and be honest with. And quite honestly, you know, there's some problems that they call their former babysitters <laughs> with. And some of those babysitters have been amazing and continue to reach out every year. You know, they go for a Christmas movie with them or they, you know, at the beginning of COVID, they did some Zoom calls with them and just checked in and, you know, because they were going to go grad dress shopping <laughs> and that couldn't happen because of COVID, but they did a Zoom date instead. Um, I, those relationships are amazing and I watch my kids with those staff and I'm just so eternally grateful, you know, to have had this, you know, this group of probably now over these years, like, I don't know, 20 people that have just made such a big impact on my kids. Um, and then I continue to do that. I just, it's beautiful. And mm -hmm. what's really cool now is some of those early folks, they have little kids now and they came up to camp this summer. And so my kids were running after their kids. So it was like a full circle moment, which was lovely. 
That's beautiful. Do your kids go to camp with other campers during the summer? Yeah, they do. So um, all of them spend at least one week at Kintail and sometimes two. And then um, one of my kids, um, Lucy, she goes to Camp Wood Eden, um, which is another camp in Ontario and Easter Seals camp for a week. Um, so yeah, they have experiences as being campers as well as being director's kids. That's really neat. And do they, yeah. what's the experience like for them to be um, a camper and like for the staff? What does that dynamic go well? Yeah, I mean, and we talk, We have had to talk about it, <laughs> what it means to be a camper. Now, normally they're so excited that they're happy to be a camper and you know, don't try to go in the office or you know, all the other areas of camp that they have access to the rest of the time. They just wanna be a camper. Now, one of my kids has pulled the, well, my parents are the directors and you'll get in trouble. <laughs> if you do this and mostly the counselors are like well I know your parents and I'm pretty sure they'd be happy with this decision <laughs> so <laughs> that doesn't happen very often and I really they you know that hopefully the counselors know that they could go talk to us if that happens but or at least somebody if not they don't feel comfortable talking to us about our own kids that they can talk to one of the other staff that's funny I, I mean kids always say the darndest things right um and they <laughs> especially when they're young, that, that filter isn't fabulous. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's funny. And I can imagine it might be a little bit nerve wracking for the staff every once in a while. Um, yes, I'm sure. And I will say, you know, I hope none of my staff are listening, but, but sometimes <laughs> my kids say when things aren't going right too, mm -hmm. um, which I appreciate as a director, you know, knowing if somebody's cutting a corner or is, you know, mm -hmm. saying something's a rule that really isn't a rule. Um, so getting that feedback is sometimes, it's just something to tuck in the back of my head to go, okay, we need to talk about that at staff training or at our next staff meeting. Um, we need to be aware of that issue. That makes sense. This has been fabulous. I'm sure other, I'm sure other camp directors, their kids are spies too. <laughs> I can't be the only one. <laughs> oh, no. I mean, I, I don't have kids, but I can walk around and like kids will say things just like offhand. And I'm like, yes. I'm sorry, what? What just happened? <laughs> oh, interesting. Okay. I'll just like file that away. That's an interesting fact. Yeah, yes. I know. Yeah. I always had a couple kids I could count on after a couple of years of ha seeing them consecutively and they, I had built that rapport and they'd come and they like, they just unload all the dirt. <laughs> it was like, awesome. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh goodness. Uh, this has been fabulous so far and we're really excited to dive into the second half of this. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. ACA Illinois loves to try new things and believes it's how we create the most dynamic impact for our campers, staff, and community. ACA Illinois knows that camp pros learn and grow in different ways, and they are there to serve each one of you. Have you heard about their new book club for camp professionals? It's a fantastic example of how they are coming up with new programming to support camp pros, even in a time where gathering in person is a challenge. That is why ACA Illinois always jumps at the chance to collaborate with content experts and countless volunteers to develop new and innovative programming. We encourage you to check out the new and innovative programming ACA Illinois is supporting by checking out the event section of their website. For the 2020-21 season, all meetings and events have been moved online to allow everyone to gather safely. This is no small feat, but ACA Illinois is committed to helping camp pros gather, network, and learn during this time. They know how important this is to supporting camp communities as they continue to grow and adapt. Ready to help us achieve this mission? Join us at ACAIL.org. So as we dive back in here, Teresa, we want to talk more about how the camping community supports parents, because that can be kind of tricky with, from our earlier conversations. It sounds like you have had a gr great support from your board, but the camp community as a whole, how could we better provide support for our parents? that work within camping? That's a really big question. <laughs> um, I know for myself, when I first started out, it was very helpful to speak to, I, I mentioned speaking to Travis and Beth and mm -hmm. um, other mentors who have had children and have worked. Um, that was really, really helpful to have some of those conversations early on to kind of imagine and dream about what it would look like to have kids at camp. Um, we wanted to have a long career here and we have so far um, and so we knew we needed to figure it out early <laughs> and well. Um, I think as a parent, you know, at 
eight o'clock at night or nine o'clock at night, you have to be in your cabin with your kids. So you also have to have staff that you really trust out on the rest of the site and doing um, all the evening things. You sort of have to shift your own idea of what a camp director might be. And I was saying, because I had done camp directing before and I had done it a certain way, I had to also change what my ideas were about that and what being a successful or a um, involved camp director look like knowing that my kids and family um, were going to come before camp um, so that was a, a big change and part of that is sometimes in the camp community we talk about and I've I've done it too I do it all the time about how we work 24 mm-hmm. 7 um, and it's a badge of honor sometimes to talk about how tired we are or how much we've worked but yeah. that's not sustainable mm-hmm. for anybody if you have kids or don't have kids so I think we need to begin to normalize saying yeah I, I stop work at eight Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> I have a friend who says camp directing is the only job where you feel guilty if you go home at eight o'clock at night. <laughs> um, you know, yep. most other yeah. jobs, you would never imagine staying there till eight o'clock and then starting again at seven the next morning. So we need to normalize that um, and um, and to check in with our friends with kids. And I've been especially thinking about colleagues with little kids during this time. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, my kids are now teenagers and are able to do a lot more on their own. If you were homeschooling kids, you know, little like kindergarten grade one kids in the middle of trying to figure out what your programming was going to look like, um, that's almost impossible. And so part of that during this time specifically is boards also understanding the unique demands um, for, for folks who are parenting and then also on the other end of the spectrum for folks who had um, other older adults in their life that they were also caring for or vulnerable um, people as well Um, so boards really needed to boards or employers whoever the case may be would really during this time need to step up and think about those needs yeah I feel like we've all had to do so much adapting I have a friend who she um she has two little ones I don't know they're like five and three I think mm-hmm. and she would work from like 7 30 to 12 30 in the morning and her husband would work 12 30 to 5 30 so they'd swap a lunch and then they would both work in the evenings yes and I was like I get because it's like somebody had to be with the kids the kids aren't old yes. enough to play on their own really yeah. like unsupervised and I was like we can't sustain this for yeah. much longer like this is not like it just no, it's not sustainable at all and even though I have teenagers and they're old enough to be able to do things I mean by the time we moved to camp, it had been several months and they're also tired of each other. Like they need Mm -hmm. us to play a game with them or to referee or to (laughs) go for a walk. And so, you know, um, in the spring, the way our jobs divide out, I ended up doing most of the camp work and Jonathan did more of the parenting as the summer went, he does more of the operations. So I did more of the parenting and he did more of the hands-on camp work. Um, But it's not sustainable over the long run to do that. And I think, um, that's something we got to really recognize right now and give each other a break. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, for sure. So I'm curious, um, and perhaps this question is a bit selfish, So um, because my partner and I would love to have children one day. And I'm wondering if you have any advice for a young person or couple who's considering having children while also a career in camping. I would say go for it. <laughs> I mean, can't, I mean, most of us are in camping because we love kids and the staff who work at camp love kids. And, um, you know, that's the whole point of camp is to create community for kids, um, positive community with amazing role models. So I, mean, I there's no better place. You know, I, I would definitely suggest it, recommend it, <laughs> encourage it. Um, you know, camp people are happy to pick up a baby or to entertain a four-year-old or, you know, to go play in the waves. I mean, it, it's, it's awesome. It is. And, I, but I do suggest that you figure out what your own limits and boundaries are um, because mm-hmm. it, it can be easy to get burned out as well. And to make sure um, that you create opportunities the rest of the year for your kids to know that they are really front and center and that this, you know, this vacation is for them. Um, not just summer Because a lot of people also say to kids who grow up at camp, oh, you're so lucky you grow up, you know, in this beautiful, fun place. And it's true with all the toys and all that. And it is really true, but they don't always get to take advantage of that the same way because they live there. So I think figuring out as a a new parents, how you want that to work. Um, uh, We've also, we've taken vacations to other camps, which has also been fun. (laughs) Oh, that's neat. Yeah, because I mean, 
it's it's a new place to play it's a fun place um and um and then you can see your camp friends that way too as parents <laughs> that it might be hard to see other times but i would definitely encourage it but know that you can't do it on your own you can't do camp and childcare. you need people to help with child care that makes sense oh i'm glad and that you're flexible flexible child care <laughs> because you need because sometimes while your kids are in bed something might happen and you might have to leave so you might need to have somebody on call to yeah. help you with that that makes sense oh i'm glad you aren't saying that like it's terrible and i should never think no. about it I was like what if, maybe i'll come onto this call and be like oh my goodness it sounds terrifying I no never... it's awesome <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I was like kind of thinking the same thing i'm like that's a lot. It seems like, a, it seems like a lot to me to figure out and to sort out and have, you know, all these systems and checks in place to make sure you have what you need to be successful for yourself in your career, but also to provide what you need to provide for your kids. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things, oh, I'll let you go ahead. I was just going to say this, this is, seems really ridiculous, but I think it's really important to Think about where your director or your staff that have children live as well. Mm -hmm. Lots of camps, like I have, I have visited camps that friends have worked at, and you know, um, the director and two kids are living in a room, you know, in the back of an office oh. building, or you know, or uh, you know, some camp building that just hasn't been maintained because it's the director and they put their energy into other places. Um, if your kids are gonna, if your kids and you as a director and your family are gonna thrive, you need enough space. Um, and that was really hard for me because I don't like spending money on my space necessarily, <laughs> but we had to in the first couple of years because the director's cabin just had two bedrooms, which felt fine when it was just me and my husband and two kids that could share a room. But then when the third one came, you know, it was awful. <laughs> you know like she, Anna could crawl out of the crib onto our bed and we couldn't open the door like it was it was awful and so we had to build on an extra bedroom um and I and then we built on a sunroom which ended up becoming a bedroom but you need space for your kids to be as well that they can retreat from camp and so the physical space seems silly but especially as a family grows, you need to make sure there's enough resources. You know, they need a bathroom with a bath for little kids. You yeah. need good washing machines that are dedicated for you. You know, we used cloth diapers. So, you know, we needed that and you need all those practical things that you don't necessarily think of if you're single or there's just two yeah. of you, you need to think through and your board it, needs to think through. Yeah. It really sounds like it comes like down to like the negotiating your contract, making sure that you have your needs met as a family, not just as an individual more so. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what might've been okay for you when you didn't have kids becomes not okay. And so you need to think that through. Yeah, that sounds, it sounds hard and like a lot, <laughs> a lot of work, but I'm also thinking like as somebody who is single and if identifies as female as well, I feel like sometimes I might want to hide the fact that maybe I want to be a parent one day or that I have kids. Have you ever felt the need to hide that you were a parent when you're in the camping world and that it might affect your ability to find or maintain a job or affect your, how people perceive your performance? With this job, I did not because I came in with these twins <laughs> that were babies and it was fairly evident. Um, <laughs> um, and it was also pretty, um, I felt pretty called to the job. Like I felt this was a job that fit me. And so I felt pretty confident about that. Um, and I thought if they didn't want all of me, then, you know, it wouldn't work for me either. Um, but I will say previously, I had definitely thought that before I had children, that people definitely wondered yeah. <laughs> and they legally could not ask about it, but they definitely, that was something that was in the back of their mind. If we hire her, is she just going to turn around and have a baby and take a year off? Um, I, I think it's very complicated. I, and I don't think any person who wants to have a child needs to um, share that if they don't want to. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's complicated. And I do think that there is discrimination um, for people that they, for um, folks who might be considering having children that the, what other people perceive as folks having children. I, I definitely think there's some discrimination. Yeah, that's really tough. Um, 
I think especially depending on what the climate is around you in terms of like support for for parents and things like that. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, we're really grateful to have lots of parental leave um, mm-hmm. and such. But even then, I'm like, you know, you hear stories of like HR trying to push people into certain situations and things. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a challenge. Do you think as leaders, it's important to talk about being a parent at camp? Um, because I feel like it's not something that we or that I hear talked about a ton. Mm-hmm. I remember at my very first OCA conference, the first session I went to was all about being a couple at camp. And at that time, mm-hmm. my partner was working with me. And so I went and I was like, wow, this is important <laughs> stuff. Um, but then I thought, you know, you don't often hear sessions on parenting. Like, do you think it's something that we need to be talking about more? Absolutely. I remember quite a few years ago, um, I had the opportunity to be at a weirdly a United Methodist camping conference in Florida um, as a visitor and I signed like the first session I signed up for was how to be a family at camp and the session was packed you know and it was almost like a relief for all of the parents in that room to just go oh yes like it's good but it's hard and how do you do this and how did you make this happen and and there was a, a couple leading the session who'd been you know at a couple different camps and had at different times one had worked or both had worked and their kids had grown up at camps and it was just a feeling of like oh I can't, I'm so glad that we're talking about this that we just haven't had the opportunity to talk about it so I think it's something we need to be talking about more mm-hmm. and I, I really liked earlier that you identified that we need to check in on uh, folks who have kids right now mm-hmm. during this pandemic and I think that you know we've put a lot of energy a lot of us into um talking about stuff during the pandemic and camp and things but I think maybe that's a a spot that we've missed a blind spot that a lot of us have had because we um, the folks at the table weren't people who had kids and I think that's something we need to keep in mind as we go forward you know the burnout in camp pros right now is super high in the first place Um, it's Mm -hmm. stressful there's so much dread managing Mm -hmm. that while also having children Um, you know I don't want to say it's harder we're all in different boats same storm but it's unique and it's different Mm -hmm. yeah and I also think that um, for younger camp pros looking at those of us who have been in the business a bit longer and who have kids, they're also watching us to say, is this sustainable? Mm -hmm. You know, we don't want young camp pros to go and look and go, yeah, that's never going to work. Like, I can't do this. You know, I can't have a family and continue this lifestyle. Um, And so we want people with experience to keep growing in it and to continue on in the business. And so we lose people too, if we don't talk about what having a family looks like at camp and how to do it sustainably. Totally. And Cassie and I feel pretty passionately about yeah. trying to make sure that we don't lose a generation of camp directors through, especially through this pandemic now yes. that, you know, Cassie and I yeah. both had to, we like to say, take a pause from camping, uh, mm-hmm. just as the world has laid itself <laughs> out. Uh, and I think we both hope to get back into it. And we worry mm-hmm. about the like folks who just are going to like walk away at this point because they find other jobs um, and perhaps other jobs that are easier to balance with their desire to have a family. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that that's a really valid point that you have there that that needs to be modeled and talked about. It shouldn't be a choice camp or kids like that shouldn't be the option. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's just that's so so important, I think, for people to hear like you need to find the place that'll help you make the best choices for your life and foresee those future goals and aspirations and not have to make a choice between your job and your life and be able to find that meaningful work-life balance. Mm -hmm. But I'm thinking about it, I'm like, as because I've always talked to a lot of parents on the phone and a lot of parents go, are you a parent yourself? And I, I I can't answer yes to that question. Do you think being a parent shifts your perspective as a director and or maybe the perspective of your clients and your parents of your campers perspective of how you manage camp i think it does (laughs) i um you know and i've been both i've been a director without kids and a director with kids i do think being able to say to another parent yep my kid has done that too or you know we've dealt with this in our family I do feel like some days that's reassuring to a parent. I'm not saying you have to be a parent to be a good camp director at all, but I do think that some parents want to identify with another parent. And I do know, you know, when we had to make all our decisions about COVID this year, um, um, when we made our announcement that we weren't going to be having summer camp, I talked about having been a camper and a counselor and a director and also a parent whose kids love camp. 
Um, and so knowing that it's like that all the kids out there are going to be upset about this decision, but also my kids are upset and I'm making this decision from all of those different hats. Um, I think it's just, it's added a, you know, a, a different richness to it. Other people bring different skills, gifts, experiences, but that's one that, that I do bring both of us bring. And I also think it'll be interesting now as my kids are getting older and as they get into staff ages, how my perspective shifts in terms of being a staff parent as opposed to a camper parent. Um, as we all know, we have to have difficult conversations with staff sometimes. And sometimes we have relationships with those camper parents as well. And so that's tricky. And so I, I, that's something I'm, I'm thinking about. What does that mean to be a, a staff parent? That's fascinating yeah. because I often watch my teenage staff do things and I, you know, and I watch them and I want the best for them, but I also know that sometimes I have to watch them make choices that I don't always agree with, whether that be like, you know, I'm just hearing about what they're going to mm -hmm. do when they leave camp or whatever, and you try and guide them. And mm -hmm. so then I think about that also as a parent and I imagine that must be a challenge. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, finally, before we wrap up here, this has been fantastic. Do you have any tips and tricks for parents at camp that you feel like you could share? I mean, hopefully I've shared some of my experience. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, for me, choosing swimming as the time we spend together every day has been really meaningful and actually continuing into COVID. You know, I felt guilty sometimes because we were living at camp and people weren't there, but we still had the benefit of this beautiful beach that we got to go to. But having that stay the same for my kids this year and for me was also really helpful So because the beach has always been a special place that we spent time together every day. Um, so finding some of those routines and um, moments that are yours and your kids, not necessarily everybody else's at camps because everybody's got you at camp, you know. Um, mm -hmm. so your, your kids need to know that. So swimming was one time for me and reading at nighttime was the other where that no matter what I was going to be present for that. And my partner will have different, he's got different times where he spends time with them. Um, and so he's built that into his routine. Um, but I think that was really important for me as a parent and really important for my kids. Um, so I just, you got to find those times and, and make them happen. And so that they're expected regular, and your kids know that they can expect you during those times as well. And then I also think, especially in the summer, you need time away from camp occasionally too. So, um, and this is more as our kids have gotten older, like they need a break as well, because camp can be really intense. And so we've on purpose, you know, gotten tickets to go see plays in the summer, or we'll go visit a grandparent in the summer, because often in the summer, they come visit us, but we try to make a point occasionally to get out of camp, because they just also need to not be on display all the time too. Um, and so I think that's also important that they get some of those summer memories, um, not at camp. So I, I was saying at the very beginning, we had um, somebody come and nanny my kids when they were really tiny. And one of the most amazing gifts is, is her family has a cottage and they, she and her sister who also worked on staff and their mom take my kids every year for five days to their cottage. So oh, that's wonderful. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and so my kids get this summer experience that's not camp, but this, you know, you know, very typical summer Canadian experience mm -hmm. um, away from camp and away from us. Um, and I, I, it's just been the most beautiful thing for them to be able to have that. And they look forward to it every year. Um, so I would see if there's ways that you can build those special things into your kids summer too. That's for them. I think it's a great spot to end on <laughs> right there to make those moments for your kids happen and do what you need to do to make it happen. Uh, so we want to just take a moment to thank you for this conversation today, Teresa. It has been absolutely great to kind of hear a direct experience of a parent at camp and making it, making it work and what looks like very manageably <laughs> and well done. Some days. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure there's days that are rough still. Um, yes. <laughs> but before we move on and kind of wrap up in our usual ways, how can our guests get in contact with you if their parenting want to have a conversation? <laughs> um, you can reach out to me by email. Um, if you go to our, our Camp Kintel website, all the information is there on all our social media. Um, 
handles as well. So that's probably the best way. Perfect. We will make sure to put that in our show notes for everybody as well. So to wrap up, uh, we like to talk about self-care and we have a little recharge station. Um, Rachel's going to be sharing with us this week about personal wellness uh, in the good times and the kind of difficult times as well. It's something that we find camp professionals struggle with as well as we personally struggle with. (laughs) Talking about how you fill your batteries and what makes you feel inspired. Rachel, take it away. All right. Well, we all know that I love uh, community and conversation and uh, honestly creating my own support group through all of this. So this is sort of a bit of a debrief uh, tool that I've been using with my group of friends, and it's a bit of an intentional debrief. And so we call it the love update. So we get together in a group. uh, And when I say together, I mean on Zoom, as one does in this day and age. Um, And we give a quick life update. Then we share an obstacle we're facing in our life, then a victory that we've experienced, um, and then something we're excited for. And we do this every couple of weeks. um, And it's just a fabulous way to hit some really key points where we get to be excited for each other, see what other folks are struggling with um, and share some support there and then also just be excited Um, and it's a good way of intentional connection because we often spend so much time swiping through TikTok and Instagram um, that we miss those more meaningful moments. I love that one. I'm going to use it today. (laughs) We want to thank everyone for joining us Beyond Camp. We hope that you were able to connect and reflect with us as we journey beyond the property lines and bring camp with us. As we wrap up today, we want you to be able to reach out and connect with us. So you can reach myself, Cassie, at cassie.bloy at stefanricard.ca. Rachel, how can our listeners reach you? They're always welcome to send me an email at kentr at girlguides.ca. Remember to check out our show notes at gocamp.pro slash beyondcamp. And a final big thank you to Teresa for joining us today. To the team at Go Camp Pro for holding space for these conversations to ACA Illinois for their sponsorship and support of this idea, to Jotham and Matt for taking the time every week to edit us and make us sound like wonderful human beings, and to you, our listeners, for continuing to listen. This keeps us moving forward. Beyond Camp is part of the Go Camp Pro podcast network. Check out all our other podcasts at gocamp.pro slash beyondcamps slash podcasts, I should say. Go well and safely, friends. We'll see you next week.